After the wedding, they had not even light refreshments. The happy pair simply drank a glass of champagne, changed into the traveling things and drove to the station. Instead of a gay wedding ball and supper, instead of music and dancing, they went on a journey to pray at a shrine 150 miles away. Many people commended this, saying that Modest Alexich was man high up in the service no longer young, that noisy wedding might not have seemed quite suitable. And music is apt to sound clearly when a government official of 52 marries a girl who is only just 18. People said too that Modest Alexeyevich, being a man of principle, had arranged this visit to the monastery expressly in order to make his young bride realize that even in marriage he put religion and morality above everything. Happy pair were seen off at the station. The crowd of relations and colleagues in the service stood with glasses in their hands, waiting for the train to start to shout hurrah, and the bride's father, Pyotr Leontich, wearing a top hat and the uniform of a teacher already drunk and very pale, kept craning towards the window, glass in hand, and saying in an imploring voice, Anyuta, Anyuta, one word. Anna bent out of the window to him, and he whispered something to her, enveloping her in a stale smell of alcohol. Blew into her ear, she couldn't make out nothing, and made the sign of the cross of her face, her bosom, and her hands. Meanwhile, he was breathing in gasps, and tears were shining in his eyes. And the schoolboys, and the brothers, Petty and Andrusha, pulled at his coat from behind, whispering in confusion, Father, that's enough. When the train started, Anna saw her father run a little way after the train, staggering and spilling his wine, and what a kind, guilty, pitiful face he had. Hurrah! he shouted. The happy pair were left alone. Modest Alexich looked about the compartment, arranged their things on the shelves, and sat down, smiling opposite his young wife. He was an official of medium height, rather stout and puffy, who looked exceedingly well nourished, with long whiskers and no moustache. His clean-shaven, round, sharply defined chin looked like the heel of a foot. The most characteristic point in his face was the absence of moustache, the bare, freshly shaven place, which gradually passed into the fat cheeks, quivering like jelly. His deportment was dignified, his movements were deliberate, his manner was soft. I cannot help remembering now one circumstance, he said, smiling, when, five years ago, Kosorotov received the order of St. Anna of the second grade, and went to thank His Excellency. His Excellency expressed himself as follows. So now you have three Annas, one in your buttonhole, and two on your neck. And it must be explained that at that time Kosorotov's wife, a quarrelsome and frivolous person, had just returned to him, and that her name was Anna. I trust that when I receive the Anna of the second grade, His Excellency will not have occasion to say the same thing to me. He smiled with his little eyes, and she too smiled, troubled at the thought that at any moment this man might kiss her with his thick damp lips, and that she had no right to prevent his doing so. The soft movements of his fat person frightened her. She felt both fear and disgust. He got up without has took off the order from his neck, took off his coat and waistcoat and put on his dressing gown. That's better, he said, sitting down beside Anna. Anna remembered what agony the wedding had been, when it had seemed to her that the priest and the guests and everyone in the church had been looking at her sorrowfully and asking why. Why was she such a sweet, nice girl marrying such an elderly, uninteresting gentleman? Only that morning she was delighted that everything had been satisfactorily arranged, but at the time of the wedding and now in the railway carriage she felt cheated, guilty and ridiculous. Here she had married a rich man and yet she had no money. Her wedding dress had been bought on credit, and when her father and brother had been saying goodbye she could see from their faces that they had not a farthing. Would they have any supper today and tomorrow? And for some reason it seemed to her that her father and the boys were sitting tonight hungry without her, and feeling the same misery as they had the day after the mother's funeral. Oh, how unhappy I am, she thought. Why am I so unhappy? With the awkwardness of a man with settled habits unaccustomed to deal with women, Modest Alexic touched her on the waist and patted her on the shoulder, while she went on thinking about money, about her mother and her mother's death. When her mother died, her father, Pyotr Leon, a teacher of drawing and writing in the high school, had taken to drink. Impoverishment had followed. The boys had not had boots or galoshes. Their father had been hauled up before the magistrate. 
The warrant officer had come and made an inventory of the furniture. What a disgrace. Anna had had to look after her drunken father, darn her brother's stockings, go to market and, when she was complimented on her youth, her beauty and her elegant manners, it seemed to her that everyone was looking at her cheap hat and the holes in her boots that were inked over. And at night there had been tears and haunting dread that her father would soon, very soon be dismissed from the school for his weakness, and that he would not survive it but would die too, like their mother. But ladies of their acquaintance had taken the matter in hand and looked about for a good match for Anna. This modest Alexeyevich, who was neither young nor good-looking, but had money, was soon found. He had the hundred thousand in the bank and the family estate which he had let on lease. He was a man of principle and stood well with his excellency. It would be nothing to him. So they told Anna to get a note from his excellency to the directors of the high school or even to the education commissioner to prevent Pyotr Leontich from being dismissed. While she was recalling these details, she suddenly heard strains of music which floated in at the window, together with the sound of voices. The train was stopping at the station, in the crowd, beyond the platform, an accordion and a cheap squeaky fiddle were being briskly played, and the sound of a military band came from beyond the villas and the tall birches and poplars that lay bathed in the moonlight. There must have been a dance in the place. Summer visitors and townspeople who used to come out here by train in fine weather for a breath of fresh air were parading up and down on the platform. Among them was the wealthy owner of all the summer villas, tall, stout, dark man called Artyonov. He had prominent eyes and looked like an Armenian. He wore a strange costume, his shirt was unbuttoned, showing his chest. He wore high boots with spurs and a black claw hung from his shoulders and dragged down the ground like a train. Two boar hounds followed him with their sharp noses to the ground. Tears were still shining in Anna's eyes, but she wasn't thinking now of her mother, nor of money, nor of her marriage. But shaking hands with school boys and officers she knew, she laughed gaily and said quickly, How do you do? How are you? She went out onto the platform between the carriages into the moonlight and stood so that they could all see her in her new splendid dress and head. Why are we stopping? she asked. This is the junction. They're waiting for the mail train to pass. Seeing that Archinov was looking at her, she screwed up her eyes cautiously and began talking aloud in French. And because her voice sounded so pleasant and because she heard music and the moon was reflected in the pond and because Archinov, the notorious Don Juan, and spoiled child of fortune, was looking at her eagerly and with curiosity, and because everyone was in good spirit, she suddenly felt joyful. And when the train started and the officers of her acquaintance saluted her, she was humming the polka, the strains of which reached her from the military band playing beyond the trees. And she returned to her compartment, feeling as though it had been proved to her at the station that she would certainly be happy in spite of everything. The happy pair spent two days at the monastery, then went back to town. They lived in a rent-free flat. When modest Alexeyevich had gone to the office, Anna played the piano, or shed tears of depression, or lay down on the couch and read novels or looked through fashion papers. At dinner, modest Alexeyevich ate a great deal and talked about politics, about appointments, transfers and promotions in the service, about the necessity of hard work, and said that family life not being a pleasure but a duty, if you took care of the copics, the rubles would take care of themselves, and that he put religion and morality before everything else in the world. And holding his knife in his fist as though it were a sword, he would say, everyone ought to have his duties. And then I listened to him, was frightened, couldn't eat, and she usually got up from the table hungry. After dinner her husband lay down for a nap and snored loudly, while Anna went to see her own people. Her father and the boys looked at her in a peculiar way, as though just before she came in they had been blaming her for having married for money, tedious, very some man she didn't love. Her rustling skirts, her bracelets, and her general air of married lady offended them and made them uncomfortable. In her presence they felt a little embarrassed and didn't know what to talk to her about. But yet they still loved her as before and were not used to having dinner without her. 
She sat down with them to cabbage soup, porridge and fried potatoes, smelling of mud and dripping. Pyotr Leontich filled his glass from the decanter with a trembling hand and drank it off hurriedly, greedily with repulsion, then pulled out a second glass and then a third. Petya and Andrusha, thin pale boys with big eyes, would take the decanter and say desperately, You mustn't, father. And Anna too was troubled and entreated him to drink no more, and he would suddenly fly into a rage and beat the table with his fist. I won't allow one to dictate to me, he would shout. Wretched boys, I turn you all out. But there was not a weakness, good nature in his voice. No one was afraid of him. After dinner he usually dressed in his best. Well, with a cut on his chin from shaving, craning his thin neck, he would stand for half an hour before the glass, brinking, combing his hair, twisting his black moustache, sprinkling himself with sand, tying his cravat in a bow. Then he would put on his gloves and his top hat and go off to give his private lessons. Or, if it was a holiday, he would stay at home and paint, or play harmonium, which wheezed and growled. He would try to rest from it pure harmonious sounds and would sink to it, or would storm at the boys. Wretches, good for nothing boys, you have spoiled the instrument. In the evening, again, a husband played cards with his colleagues who lived under the same roof in the government course. The wives of this gentleman would come in, ugly, tastelessly dressed women, as squires, as cooks, and gossip would begin in the flat as tasteless and unattractive as the ladies themselves. Sometimes Modest Alexis would take Anna to the theatre. In the intervals he would never let her steep step from his side, but walked about arm in arm with her through the corridors and the foyer. When he bowed to someone he immediately whispered to Anna, civil counselor, visits at his excellencies, or a man of means has a house of his own. When they passed the buffet Anna had a great longing for something sweet. She was fond of chocolate and apple cakes, but she had no money. She didn't like to ask her husband. He would take the pair, pinch it with his fingers, and ask uncertainly, How much? Twenty-five kopecks. I say, he would reply, and put it down. But, as it was awkward to leave the buffet without buying anything, he would order some seltzer water and drink the whole bottle himself, and tears would come into his eyes. And Anna hated him at such times. And suddenly, flushing crimson, he would say to her rapidly, Boo to that old lady. But I don't know her. No matter. That's the wife of the director of the local treasury. Boo, I tell you. He would grumble insistently. Your head won't drop off. Anna bought, and her head certainly didn't drop off, but it was agonizing. She did everything her husband wanted her to, and was furious with herself for having let him deceive her like the veriest idiot. She had only married him for his money, and yet she had less money now than before her marriage. In old days her father would sometimes give her twenty copies, but now she had not a farting. To take money by stealth or ask for it, she couldn't. She was afraid of her husband, she trembled before him. She felt as though she had been afraid of him for years. In her childhood, the director of the high school had always seemed the most impressive and terrifying force in the world, sweeping down like a thunderstorm or a steam engine ready to crush her. Another similar force of which the whole family talked, and of which they were for some reason afraid, was His Excellency. Then there was dozen others, less formidable, and among them the teachers at the high school, with shaven up lips, stern, implacable. And now finally there was Modest Alexeyevich, a man of principle, who even resembled the director in the face. And in Anna's imagination all these forces blended together into one, and in the form of a terrible, huge white bear, Anna's the weak and earring such as her father. And she was afraid to say anything in opposition to her husband, and gave a forced smile, and tried to make show of pleasure when she was quietly caressed and defiled by embraces that excited her terror. Only once Piotr Leontich had the timidity to ask for a loan of fifty rubles in order to pay a very irksome debt, but what an agony it had been. Very good, I'll give it to you, said Mother Stalexic after a moment's thought. But I warn you, I won't help you again till you give up drinking. Such a failure is disgraceful in the man in the government service. It must remind you of the well-known fact that many capable people have been ruined by that passion, though they might possibly with temperance have risen in time to a very high. 
and long-winded phrases followed, inasmuch as, following upon which proposition, in view of the aforesaid contention, and Pyotr Leontich was in agonies of humiliation, and felt an intense craving for alcohol. And when the boys came to visit Anna generally in broken boots and thread bear trousers, they too had to listen to sermons. Every man ought to have his duties, Modest Alexeyevich would say to them. And he did not give them money, but he did give Anna bracelets, rings and brooches, saying that these things would come in useful for a rainy day. And he often unlocked her drawer and made an inspection to see whether they were all safe. Meanwhile, winter came on. Long before Christmas there was an announcement in the local papers that the usual winter ball would take place in 29th of December in the Hall of Nobility. Every evening after cards, Modest Alexeyevich was excitedly whispering with his colleagues, wives and glancing at Anna, and then paced up and down the room for a long while, thinking. At last, late one evening, he stood still facing Anna and said, You ought to get yourself a ball dress. Do you understand? Only please consult Maria Grigorievna and Natalia Kuzminishna. And he gave her a hundred rubles. She took the money, but she didn't consult any of one. She ordered the ball dress. She spoke to no one but her father, and tried to imagine how her mother would have dressed for a ball. Her mother had always dressed in the latest fashion, had always taken trouble over Anna, dressing her elegantly like a doll, and had taught her to speak French and dance the mazurka superbly. She had been a governess for five years before her marriage. Like her mother, Anna could make a new dress out of an old one, clean gloves with benzene, high jewels, and like her mother, she knew how to scrub her eyes, lisp, assume graceful attitudes, fly into raptures when necessary, and throw a mournful and enigmatic look into her eyes. And from her father she had inherited the dark color of her fair and eyes her highly strung nerves and the habit of always making herself look her best. When half an hour before setting off for the ball, Modest Alexeyevich went into her room without his coat on to put his order around his neck before her pier glass. Dazzled by her beauty and the splendor of her fresh, ethereal dress, he combed his whiskers complacently and said, So that's what my wife can look like. So that's what you can look like, Anuta. He went on, dropping into a tone of solemnity. I've made you fortune. Now I beg you to do something for me. I beg you to get introduced to the wife of His Excellency. For God's sake, please do. Through her, I might get the post of senior reporting clerk. They went to the ball. They reached the Hall of Nobility, the entrance with the hall porter. They came to the vestibule, with the headstands, fur coats, footmen scurrying about, and ladies with low necks footing up their fence to screen themselves from the draughts. There was a smell of gas and of soldiers. When Anna, walking upstairs on her husband's arm, heard the music and saw herself full length in the looking glass in the full glow of lights, there was a rush of joy in her heart, and she felt the same presentiment of happiness as in the moonlight at the station. She walked in proudly, confidently, for the first time feeling herself not a girl but a lady and unconsciously imitating her mother in her walk and in her manner. And for the first time in her life she felt rich and free. Even her husband's presence didn't oppress her, for as she crossed the threshold of the hall she had guessed instinctively that the proximity of an old husband did not detract from her in the least but, on the contrary, gave her that shade of piquant mystery that is so attractive to men. The orchestra was already playing and the dance had begun. After they fled, Anna was overwhelmed by the lights, the bright colors, the music, the noise, and, looking around the room, thought, oh, how lovely. She at once distinguished in the crowd all her acquaintances, everyone she had met before at parties or picnics, all the officers, the teachers, the lawyers, the officials, the landowners, His Excellency, Archionov, and the ladies of the high standing, dressed up in very decolleges, handsome and ugly, who had already taken up their positions in the stalls and pavilions of the charity bazaar to begin selling things for the benefit of the poor. A huge officer in Ipolets, she had been introduced to him in Starokievsky Street when she was a schoolgirl, but now she couldn't remember his name, 
seemed to spring from out of the ground, begging her for rewards, and she flew away from her husband, feeling as though she were floating away in a sailing boat in a violent storm, while her husband was left far away on the shore. She danced passionately with fervor, a waltz, then a polka and a quadrille, being snatched by one partner as soon as she was left by another, dizzy with music and the noise, mixing Russian with French, and with no thought of her husband or anything else. She excited great admiration among the men, that was evident, and indeed it could not have been otherwise. She was breathless with excitement, felt thirsty, and convulsively clutched her fan. Pyotr Leontich, her father, in a crumpled dress coat that smelled of benzene, came up to her, offering her a plate of pink ice. You are enchanting this evening, he said, looking at her rapturously. And I have never so much regretted that you were in such a hurry to get married. What was it for? I know you did it for our sake, but... With a shaking hand he drew out a roll of notes and said, I got the money for my lessons today and can pay your husband what I owe him. She put the plate back into his hand and was pounced upon by someone and borne off to a distance. She caught a glimpse of her partner's shoulders of her father gliding over the floor, putting his arm round a lady and whirling down the ballroom with her. How sweet he is when he is sober, she thought. She danced the mazurka with the same huge officer. He moved gravely, as heavily as a dead carcass in a uniform, twitched his shoulders and his chest stamped his feet very languidly, he felt fearfully disinclined to dance. She fluttered round him, provoking him by her beauty, her bare neck, her eyes glowed defiantly. Her movements were passionate, while he became more and more indifferent and held out his hands to her as graciously as a king. Bravo, said people watching them. But little by little the huge officer too broke out. He grew lively, excited, and overcome by her fascination, was carried away and danced lightly, usefully while she merely moved her shoulders and looked slightly at him, as though she were not the queen and he were her slave. And at that moment it seemed to her that the whole room was looking at them, and that everybody was thrilled and envied them. The huge officer had hardly had time to thank her for the dance, when the crowd suddenly parted and the men drew themselves up in a strange way, with their hands at their sides. His Excellency, with two stars on his dress coat, was walking up to her. Yes. His Excellency was walking straight toward her, for he was staring directly at her with a sugary smile, while he licked his lips as he always did when he saw a pretty woman. Delighted, delighted, he began. I shall order your husband to be clapped in lock-up for keeping such a treasure hidden from us till now. I've come to you with a message from my wife, he went on, offering her his arm. You must help us. Yes, we ought to give you the price for beauty, as they do in America the Americans. My wife is expecting you impatiently. He led her to a stall and presented her to a middle-aged lady, the lower part of whose face was disproportionately large, so that she looked as though she were holding a big stone in her mouth. You must help us, she said through her nose in a sing-song voice. All the pretty women are working for our charity bazaar, and you are the only one enjoying yourself. Why won't you help us? She went away, and Anna took her place by the cups and the silver samovar. She was soon doing a lively trade. Anna asked no less than a ruble for a cup of tea, and made the huge officer drink three cups. Artyonov, the rich man with prominent eyes who suffered from asthma, came up to. He was not dressed in the strange costume in which Anna had seen him in the summer at the station, but wore a dress coat like everyone else. Keeping his eyes fixed on Anna, he drank a glass of champagne and paid a hundred rubles for it, then drank some tea and gave another hundred, all this without saying a word, as he was short of breath through asthma. Anna invited purchasers and got money out of them, firmly convinced by now that her smiles and glaze could not fail to afford these people great pleasure. She realized now that she was created exclusively for this noisy, brilliant laughing life with this music its dancers, its adorers, and her old terror of a force that was sweeping down upon her and menacing to crush her seemed to her ridiculous. She was afraid of no one now, and only regretted that her mother could not be there to rejoice at her success. Pyotr Leontich, pale by now but still steady on his legs, came up to the stall and asked for a glass of brandy. Anna turned crimson, expecting him to say something inappropriate. She was already ashamed of having such a poor and ordinary father. But he emptied his glass, took ten rubles out of his roll of notes, 
flung it down and walked away with dignity without uttering a word. A little later she saw him dancing in the grand chain, and by now he was staggering and kept shouting something to the great confusion of his partner. And Anna remembered how, at the ball three years before, he had staggered and shouted in the same way and it had ended in the police surgeons taking him home to bed, and next day the director had threatened to dismiss him from his post. How inappropriate that memory was. When the samovars were put out in the stalls and the exhausted ladies handed over the takings to the middle-aged lady with the stone in her mouth, Archinov took Anna on his arm to the ball where supper was served to all who had assisted at the bazaar. There were some twenty people at supper, no more, but it was very noisy. His Excellency proposed a toast. In this magnificent dining room it will be appropriate to drink to the success of the cheap dining rooms, which are the object of today's bazaar. The brigadier general proposed the toast to the power by which even the artillery is vanquished, and all the company clinked glasses with the ladies. It was very, very gay. When Anna was escorted home it was daylight and the cooks were going to market. Joyful, intoxicated, full of new sensations, exhausted, she undressed, dropped into bed and at once fell asleep. It was past one in the afternoon when the servant waked her and announced that Mr. Archinov had called. She dressed quickly and went down into the drawing room. Soon after Archinov, His Excellency called to thank her for her assistance in the bazaar. With a sugary smile chewing his lips, he kissed her hand and, asking her permission to come again, took his leave, while she remained standing in the middle of the drawing room, amazed, enchanted, unable to believe that this change in her life, this marvelous change, had taken place so quickly. And at that moment Modest Alexeyevich walked in, and he too stood before her now with the same ingratiating, sugary, cringingly respectful expression which she was accustomed to see on his face in the presence of the great and powerful. And with rapture, with indignation, with contempt, convinced that no harm would come to her from it, she said, articulating distinctly each word, Be off, you blockhead. From this time forward, Anna never had one day free, as she was always taking part in picnics, expeditions, performances. She returned home every day after midnight and went to bed on the floor in the drawing room, and afterwards used to tell everyone touchingly how she slept under flowers. She needed a very great deal of money, but she was no longer afraid of Modest Alexeyevich, and spent his money as though it were her own. And she did not ask, did not demand it, simply sent him in the bills. Give birth to hundred rubles, or pay one hundred rubles at once. At Easter, Modest Alexeyevich received the Anna of the second grade. When he went to offer his thanks, his Excellency put aside the paper he was reading and settled himself more comfortably in his chair. So now you have three Annas, he said, scrutinizing his white hands and pink nails. One on your buttonhole and two on your neck. Modest Alexeyevich put two fingers to his lips as a precaution against laughing too loud and said, Now I have only to look forward to the arrival of the little Vladimir. I make bold to beg your Excellency to stand godfather. He was alluding to Vladimir of the fourth grade, and was already imagining how he would tell everyone the story of this pun, so happy in its readiness and audacity, and he wanted to say something equally happy, but his excellency was buried again in his newspaper and merely gave him a nod. And Anna went on driving about with three horses, going out hunting with Archinov, playing in one-act dramas, going out to supper, and was more and more rarely with her own family. They dined now alone. Pyotr Leontich was drinking more heavily than ever. There was no money, and the harmonium had been sold long ago for debt. The boys did not let him go alone in the street now, but looked after him for fear he might fall down. And whenever they met Anna driving in Starokievsky Street with a pair of horses and Archinov on the box instead of a coachman, Pyotr Leontich took off his hope head and was about to shout to her, but Petya and Andrusha took him by the arm and said him prolonely, You mustn't, father, you mustn't. 